Hello and welcome everybody to this lecture uh, about the Leslie model. And uh, this is uh, lecture 56A or uh, section 56A, which uh, I believe I chose that title because this is really not covered in the book or not covered in this way in the book. But you might remember that I started the class with a, an example about a Leslie model, which basically gave us an example of setting up a system of linear equations. And we're basically back to that now, except that now we have, um, especially in the form of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, um, a whole bunch of tools that we can use to analyze these Leslie models um, in more generality. Um, but the idea for the Leslie model is that you basically have a species of, let's say, animal, and you only consider the number of females um, in each of the n generations of um, sort of the uh, animal uh, population, I guess. So, so you can kind of think of this as the first year, the second year, uh, the third year, and so on. And um, the idea is that we kind of want to keep track of um, the females um, xi. So xi is the number of females in the ith age group. And we want to keep track of this number here uh, by basically um, looking at reproduction rates and survival rates, okay? So the idea is that if we're in the first generation, um, if we look at the number of females in the first generation, then uh, in order to kind of transition to the second generation, so to basically to uh, live another year, um, this factor of C1 comes in. So this basically, the C1 is a survival rate. So if C1 is 80%, for example, and 80% of the females in the first age group survive to go on to the second age group, and so on. So we basically have that the CIs are survival rates. Okay, and these uh, by the by the nature have to be numbers between I guess uh, strictly between zero and. Uh, they could be uh, they could be one if 100% survive, but in a realistic model, that's probably not going to be the case. Um, and they should be positive, right? Because if we have no survival from some uh, generation on, then the next generation will simply not exist. Um, so we have that, and we also have the BIs, and these are reproduction rates. And so, uh, so specifically, uh, these are the number of females. Um, the average number of females uh, of female offspring. Okay. Uh, in the in the ith generation. So that's uh, sort of goes for both of these numbers here. So that number here uh, really just is going to be um, greater or equal to zero, that's all the only illustration we have here. Uh, in, in fact, we kind of probably want uh, many of these BIs to be greater than one. Um, and that's usually what's gonna happen in uh, realistic models. Uh, but by, so these are again multipliers. So um, usually B1 is zero because the, the females in the first generation are immature, so, uh, or juveniles, so they won't be able to reproduce. But B2, if B2, for example, is three, that means that uh, on average for every female in the second generation, we have uh, three females being born that is going into the first generation. So this is the setup for the Leslie model. And the whole idea of it is to kind of look at um, this as a discrete dynamical system. So basically what happened in the previous section so I'm uh, going to kind of also use a superscript here to indicate, um, right, what iterate or what year we're in, okay, by using this um, uh, letter K, all right? Uh, the whole point of this is that we can kind of take the model, which is really defined by these definitions here, if you want, 
and turn it into, a, into mathematical equations. And the idea is basically that if I want to transition from the kth to the k plus first generation, so basically I want to express xi of k plus one, okay, in terms of the xi's of the kth generation, at least it works like that in this model here, then we basically can come up with uh, two equations uh, or two sets of equations, right? Um, so the whole reproduction thing really only affects the first generation. So if I'm basically just looking at i's going from 2 to n, then right, what the sort of next generation, uh, the k plus first generation at the i-th level, will simply be ci times xi of the kth generation, uh, of xi minus 1 of the kth generation. Okay? Or the way I wrote it in the slides, and maybe that's actually a little bit more systematic, I guess, but uh, then I have to, well, then I have to change this like that. Okay? So, yes, okay, so that is kind of, right, the first set of equations that we have, and then for the first generation, things are special, right, because those don't, don't really survive from somewhere, but they're being born, and there the idea is that we simply get a linear combination of all the other x's, okay, or the weights of this linear combination, the bi's, are simply the average reproduction rates. So we get, in terms of equations, something that looks like this. Okay. So these are. This is the Leslie model in terms of equations, and th this really, right, um, with a little bit. Um, added generality is brings us uh, sort of back to the first lecture in this class. Uh, but the point is that we can also now express these equations in, in the form of a matrix. And then if we have specific numbers for those CIs and the BIs, we can analyze that matrix and sort of see what happens in the long run for, um, right, if I have a, and, and I'm sorry, to back up a little bit, so if, if I have an initial distribution, um, in these age groups given by the vector, basically by x. I'm not sure if I'm using zero or one here. I think I'm using probably, um, zero, okay. Um, so if I have an initial distribution in those n age groups, what happens to that initial distribution in the long run, okay? And so again, the first step to kind of get there is to set up the Leslie matrix, which is simply a matrix version of these equations here. So, um, so the Leslie matrix L, to get that, we basically just have to think about, right, what happens if I want to express the vector for the k plus first generation as a matrix times the vector in the kth generation. And you basically just have to sort of write, visualize um, how these equations here appear in terms of a matrix form. So the first line here would basically give me the first row of that, or this box statement here would basically give me the first row of the matrix. And there you can kind of see that there I will simply have the BIs in that row. Okay. And um, for the other one, for the other rows of the matrix here, I'm simply using these equations here. So that will basically give me 
um, a sort of diagonal pattern like this. Okay, up to Cn minus one, right? Because that only goes up to Cn minus one. And actually, let me put in the Bn minus one here just so everything lines up better. So I'll get zeros all the way down here and zeros everywhere here as well. Okay, so this matrix here in general is the Leslie matrix. So this is an N by N matrix. This is the Leslie matrix, usually denoted by L. And the nice thing about all of this is that now we can basically right, express the dynamical system if you want that we have as given by this as, as given by applying this Leslie matrix right in each step. Okay, so that's kind of the um, general overhead for today. And I just want to kind of do two examples, and there's also one or two slides with general theoretical results about Leslie matrices. Um, most of these are uh, not, we can't, we probably can't prove them in this class um, because we would have to get into some maybe deeper theory. Um, but this is, this section here is really uh, a very applied one. So, so I just want to, um, as the first example here, revisit the first example in class, okay, where we in effect had this, uh, right, in our newfound terminology, we had this Leslie matrix here. So, okay. So in that example, we had three generations, and um, the first generation is immature, so there's no reproduction there, but on, for the second generation, on average, we have three females being born per female, and for the third generation, on average, we have one female being born per female, and uh, that's the first line, and then these are our survival rate rates, so, um, the survival rate from the first to the second generation is 30%, and from the second to the third is 33%, okay? And here's the point of all of this. Uh, I don't want to really um, get into too much into calculations uh, that we sort of know how to do already. So the idea is to look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this Leslie matrix, and you can see, due to the fact that, well, I don't know, um, due to the fact that this matrix is mostly sparse, so especially for bigger dimensional systems, we have a lot of zeros. Calculating the characteristic polynomial is not too hard, but finding the zeros of it is. So um, I will probably also post some R files um, on how to do eigenvalues and eigenvectors in R. Um, but you can also find online calculators for those. So I really encourage doing that um, because having to go through the cubic part and having to you know, guess where a cubic polynomial intersects the x-axis and that sort of stuff isn't really very efficient. So if we kind of either use R or if you use an online calculator, or your TI might be able to do that as well. I don't know that offhand right now, whether it can do eigenvalues or eigenvectors. Um, we get these three eigenvalues here, okay? So one of them is one, and that is significant, okay? Uh, that'll um, mean something very specific. So these are the eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors, which you can sort of calculate, but probably don't want to, are these, whoops, that's V1. So this is the eigenvector corresponding to lambda one equals one. The other two eigenvectors, as we will see in a couple of minutes, won't matter. 
Okay, so so when you calculate these eigenvalue vectors or eigen yeah these eigenvectors uh, using R or the calculator, you might get a not exactly these but a multiple um, of these given eigenvectors. It's simply sort of how the specific calculator or program. Um, prefers to calculate or to um, basically standardize these. So I kind of chose them. So the last component is one that's a you know, completely arbitrary choice, really. But the point is, if we kind of revisit, um, or if you remember what happened in the previous section. So we basically have a starting vector x0, and we repeat repeatedly apply this matrix L to it. And in order to understand what's happening in the long run, um, it is best to express this eigen, this vector here in terms of the basis given by the eigenvectors, okay? So I'm basically just gonna write this thing as x1, v1 plus x2, v2 plus x3, v3, okay? Which is fine because it's a basis, I can always do that. And the point is, and this is really the, the main point for today, really as it was the main point for the discrete linear dynamical systems that we had, is that if I want to right, figure out what's the nth iterate, so I'm kind of a little bit changing notation here because I used to have on the previous board this, and actually let me just it's not going to be like that in the slides. Um, let me preserve that superscript notation. So then, uh, right, the nth iterate is ln of x0 vector. But the point of all of this is, right, so if I apply L to this right-hand side here, um, um, then... So I'm stammering that the dog is being uh, very, uh, she can't show you this, but she has her ball and, and is sort of very enticing to, do you, do you want me to throw your ball? Okay, I'll throw it, okay, all right. Okay. If she wants to play, what can I do? Okay, anyways, the thing is, if I apply my L to this thing here, right, then I get x1 times L of v1, but L of v1 is because lambda 1 is equals to equals 1. L of v1 is v1, okay? And these two here, these vectors v2 and v3 are multiplied by their corresponding eigenvalues, which again, this is significant, are less than one in absolute value, okay? So in other words, I can, and I hope that makes sense, I can write, my nth iterate like this. So this x1, v1 doesn't change at all, okay? And for the other components, these tend to um, diminish, okay, at an exponential rate. So we basically are getting this as our nth iterate if we're choosing a coordinate system that's spanned by the eigenvectors, all right? So you can kind of see that as n goes to infinity, right, so in the long run for the system, and if I say in the long run, that doesn't mean, you know, uh, you have to be whatever effect we're observing here, that that takes a thousand generation, uh, because it's an exponential decrease, that sort of, asymptotic um, pattern establishes this itself pretty quickly. I mean, if you put in n equals 10 here, you know, you'll see that the coefficients of these numbers are already very small. Um, but the idea is basically that, right, Ln simply becomes So in other words, right, uh, what we get is simply the V1 component of the initial starting vector, okay? So I'm basically just expressing my starting vector, x0 vector, in terms of this basis. 
and what survives in the long run is this. Okay, so uh, we kind of see that what happens here is that we kind of have that this x star vector, right? If I kind of write x1 v1 be the x star vector, then I have two things if I apply L to x star, it stays what it is, okay? And this is what we call, uh, so if that's the case, we have that x star is an equilibrium solution or a steady state. of this discrete uh, linear dynamical system, okay? Um, and that's fine. So basically, if I write, have any vector that I can write as a multiple of V1, it'll stay the same under application of L. But we also have that right, Xn, right, any starting vector will converge to that equilibrium solution. So it is what you could call a stable equilibrium, okay? Um, that's something that we're going to do extensively in differential equations, but right now, right, this basically means the asymptotic behavior is that any starting position or any initial distribution um, approaches equilibrium given by x star, okay? So again, right, if you have any, uh, I kind of don't have a concrete um, sort of computational example for this right now, but if you have any given uh, vector x0, okay, any starting vector, any distribution of the number of females uh, in those three generations, you simply find, right, it's V1 component, which is X1, and that's what, where you'll end up after, you know, really a couple of iterates. Uh, 10 will certainly get you pretty close to that um, pretty quickly. Okay, so that is um, the example and also the definition of this sort of equilibrium solution steady state of a dynamical system. And the next slide, which I don't want to write on the board and which I don't want to say too much about right now because it'll I'll kind of explain that in the next example, gives us some very useful facts about um, a Leslie matrix, okay? Um, so basically, uh, the only restriction that, that we have there, which I haven't mentioned, is that at least two BIs are strictly positive. Uh, consecutive BI. So this is kind of, that simply means that um, the BI's are technically allowed to be zero, okay, um, but we need two consecutive ones to be positive. So there must be two consecutive generations um, of females that always have offspring, okay. Uh, so that's again something that we certainly would expect, okay, because if these females for some reason become in infertile, um, uh, for you know, at least two subsequent generations, you can kind of see that mathematically it doesn't really make a difference, but in a bi biological sense, that's not very likely to happen. But anyways, don't want to dwell too much on that, as I just mentioned before. But the idea is that in general, for a Leslie matrix, I have a unique positive eigenvalue. So that means, right, when we look at the eigenvalues here, one of them is one, which is a very special situation. Usually you don't have that steady state, okay? So again, having an equilibrium solution, as you can see here, means we have to have, right, we need lambda equals one as an eigenvalue, okay? That's not at all in general guaranteed, okay? And for general Leslie matrices, this would be a very special case, okay? But the thing is, we have only one eigenvalue that is positive, okay? It could be uh, less than one or greater than one, and we'll see in the next example what that means physically for the system, okay? 
uh, all the other ones are negative, okay, which we can see here, okay, and um, this lambda one has algebraic multiplicity one, so it just occurs with, with multiplicity one in the characteristic polynomial, and the eigenvector that corresponds to this um, first eigenvalue has positive components, so that sort of means it's a, you know, feasible or realistic vector for giving us a distribution of a population, okay? And all the other eigenvalues are smaller in magnitude than lambda one, okay? That's strictly unique, strictly unique positive eigenvalue lambda one. So in other words, the fact that they're like uh, smaller in absolute value uh, means that um, this lambda one is the dominant eigenvalue and um, actually technically strictly dominant. And if all of what I just said here um, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, I just want to maybe skip that slide there and go back to it and just explain really what's happening here in terms of an example. So you could say, do I need that theory if I have a specific Leslie matrix? Uh, not really, right? Because there you can kind of verify all those things that I just mentioned for that specific example. So let's maybe just approach things like that, okay? So here is another Leslie matrix, okay? And it is a three by three system, simply for the sake of keeping things a little bit more concise, all right? So there's no reason why we can't do anything bigger than that, especially if we're using software. Okay, so, so that's uh, the idea, right? Again, these are reproduction rates, these are survival rates. So we just wanna analyze the system, okay? We don't really wanna kind of do any computations in the sense that we have 1,000 and 500 and 300 individuals in the beginning. What do we have after 17 generations? Not really sort of interesting in a higher level mathematical sense, okay? But what we do is we do our eigenvalues and eigenvectors, okay? So the idea is like the theory just uh, that we just had gave us that there is one eigenvalue that's strictly positive and dominant. So that means that has to be this one, right? Because it is already positive. And it's dominant because the other two are smaller in magnitude, okay? So I'm gonna, these are really not interesting at all for us, okay? Okay? And also not interesting at all for us, at least on the theoretical level right now, um, is what the corresponding eigenvectors to these two are, okay? We kind of need them to find the component of the first eigenvector, um, but uh, since that's not the point of the example, I will sort of um, accept myself <laughs> doing that. Uh, so yeah, you, you, you can see them in the slides, okay? So you can see that this is the course, so this is the important stuff, okay? So we have um, this 1.5, and this is an eigenvector, okay? That corresponds to that eigenvalue of 1.5. And so again, the idea is, right, if I have, so this is eigenvalues, eigenvectors, really. So the idea is if I have my x0 vector, Okay, so I need to express that in terms of this new basis. So that is x1, v1 plus x2, v2 plus x3, v3. Okay, so again, just as a brief reminder, and I'll maybe just say that, um, it is certainly um, somewhere, it certainly has been mentioned previously uh, more than once, like, the idea is that you have to set up the matrix P with the eigenvectors as column vectors, and then basically like, apply P inverse to the uh, actual coordinates of the starting vector. So if my starting vector right, 
uh, let's say just a brief example is my starting vector in the usual coordinates. So that is in the coordinates of the um, different age groups. So for example, if this is my initial distribution, okay, then in order to get this x1, x2, and x3, I have to basically take p inverse of that matrix here, uh, of that vector here, okay? So, so this means that I've got my x1, x2, x3, so the, the coordinates in terms of that basis here are p inverse of that, okay? All right, so that's just sort of a side remark. It is really nothing. I'm not gonna follow up on this computationally, but here's again the idea, all right? If I take the nth iterate of that starting vector here, I can pretty much say very clearly, both quantitatively and geometrically, what happens, okay? To not really just this initial distribution. That's why maybe I'm not choosing a specific initial distribution. Um, Right, because I can say that in the nth generation, I will have this vector here, but right, each time I apply the matrix L, this vector here gets multiplied by 1.5. So I basically have x1 times 1.5 to the n v1, okay? And then plus x2 times negative, whatever the next eigenvalue was. Okay. So what's a little bit different about this example, and I will show you in really in the next slide how to kind of clarify or um, deal with that is now as n goes to infinity, right, we have, um, things aren't, or at this point, don't appear to be quite as clear as um, what we had in the previous example, because here as n goes to infinity, this one will go to zero, but this one will still increase in magnitude, okay? Um, but the thing is that I can still get a big, uh, clear picture of what the asymptotic behavior is by simply using an, a little algebraic trick, okay, which involves simply factoring out the 1.5 to the n out of this whole expression. Okay, we didn't have to do that in the first example because there we had one to the n, so there was nothing to factor out, right? Um, but the point is that, um, how am I writing this here? And I forgot a V2 here. I'm rewriting things like this. Okay. And so now the idea is that if I kind of wanted to and technically we're comparing two growth rates uh, of two quantities, which is something that you might have done in Calc 1 um, when you did limits. Here's the, the observation, right? It's as n gets large, these two here will really approach the zero vector, okay? So what really survives that uh, n going to infinity is, right, that I basically have that x to the n asymptotically, okay, is expressible as 1.5 to the n times x1 times v1, okay? So in other words, uh, what will happen in the long run is two things, and that is um, maybe merits writing on the board, right? So this basically means two things. Um, so for n large, we can say two things. Um, the 1.5 tells us that for every gen right, for every year, uh, for every iteration, um, for every iterate, um, x n. Um, 
increases by 50, roughly 50%. Okay, it's roughly because it's an asymptotic state. Okay, that, that's where the 1.5 comes from. So overall, this population grows rapidly, 50% per year. You could argue, is that realistic? What kind of organism would do that? Um, I'll leave that for you to decide um, based on your bio knowledge. But it's, it's, it doesn't matter, right? And, and it's, right, if you have a more realistic model, the math is still true, okay? And the other thing is, right, uh, we're basically approaching, right, um, so the distribution of Xn, okay? That means in terms of actual numbers of animals or organisms or whatever you want to call it, right, that distribution, of course, will, right, that the, these triples of, of vectors, okay, um, um, will, of course, increase, right? All three generations will increase in size, but basically uh, the distribution has a ratio given by the eigenvector that corresponds to that 1.5, okay? So the thing is, has ratios of 18, um, I can just find that, was on 18 to 61. Okay, so these are the three components of that eigenvector that we had. So for every, right, in the long run, for every individual in the third generation, we have 16 individuals. In the third generation, yes, we have 18 individuals, sorry, in the first generation. Okay, for every individual in, in the third generation, we have six individuals in the second generation. Okay, you can calculate the absolute numbers again by doing this essentially effectively just right this is the only thing you have to calculate in order to work with the actual numbers themselves but this is just the relative uh, distribution in terms of ratios so i'll just go back uh, to the slide i skipped so you can kind of see right what matters here is right very much what that lambda one is right so the lambda one in this example is 1.5 Okay, so if that lambda one is greater than one, as in this example here, we have exponential growth. Okay, if lambda is one, we have an equilibrium a solution, we have an equilibrium for the model. Again, kind of a rare situation, and maybe that first example was a little bit contrived in that sense. Um, so there, everything would kind of settle down towards a steady state solution, and um. If lambda one is less than one, it can't be zero, right? It is a positive number. But if this is, let's say, 0.9, then in each uh, iterate, we would have a 10% decrease uh, in the long run. And then we basically have overall an exponential decrease in the population number. So if lambda one is less than one, this population wouldn't be viable in the long run, okay? So I hope that made sense. Uh, this is kind of a nice, I think, uh, concrete example of what we've learned about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Thank you.